All right, today's guest is Mike Carr of Namestormers, and uh, they are specialists in naming companies, products, processes, whatever it is that you need named. Mike Carr and his team are the, the go-to source there. They have offices in Austin and Boston, and he's been in this game for 35 plus years. He is chock full of stories, and because he's a creative guy, this is going to be one of my favorite interviews um, because I love talking to people who have seen a lot, uh, done a little face planting, seen big successes, and um, so we really appreciate you, Mike, being here on the Brain Manual podcast today. Absolutely. Welcome. I'm glad to be here. Yes, thanks. Well, Mike, uh, okay. The, I, my mind always goes towards the business side of things, and I'm I am fascinated by how do you have a whole business that's centered around helping people name things. I mean, can you give us a little bit of context for who would even need such a service? When we started this company, that was a huge uphill battle, right? I mean, I would tell friends and family and colleagues. And it was almost embarrassing. You know, they'd ask, what are you doing? How can you make a living doing that? Why is it hard to do that? I mean, could you just sit down over a couple of beers in the back of a napkin <laughs> and write down a few names, right? And that's sort of the romanticized way people think about naming. It's fun. It's creative. You get the beers out. You get the, the alcohol flowing. And you've got some great names in a few hours. <laughs> right, right. And unfortunately, especially today, back in the 80s and 90s even, it was a whole lot easier, partially because it really wasn't a global economy. You really didn't have the internet, at least not the internet in a commercial sense that was global. Right. You know, smartphones didn't exist. And so you just didn't have the noise and the confusion mm -hmm. with doing a Google search and finding a name in the UK or in Shanghai that you know pops up in your browser. I mean, it was very localized and it was much easier. What we always tell folks today is coming up with names that are exciting and cool is really not that hard if you do it all the time. And we do, right? We do it right now, we're doing it seven days a week, we're so busy. What's hard, what's really hard is coming up with a name that you can use. Mm -hmm. And what we mean by that is number one, it has to pass the trademark hurdle, right? And that's a big hurdle to pass. Just because you've thought of this great name and you've done a search in your local area or maybe even in your state and you haven't found any conflicts and maybe even you can register it as you're doing business as name in your state absolutely has nothing at all to do with trademark law. If anybody in the country owns that trademark in your class of goods and services in the business that you're in, they can prevent you from using it. And that is really hard. Yes. And then, of course, there's lots of other stuff, but that's sort of the, the first hurdle to overcome. Now, I can keep talking about that, but if there's some other things you guys would like to ask me first, fire away. Well, I mean, you're, you're kind of touching on what I would want, want to ask, and, and part of that is the trademark ability of it, but what makes a great name? Well, a lot of, a lot of folks think that the name needs to sound cool or that a great name is something that's just going to grab them, right? They see the name and they just know it's right. Yeah. Right. That does not happen. Right. I mean, in, in thousands of projects over three and a half decades, I can count on one hand the number of times that that's happened. And usually it happens for the wrong reason. The best names need to do only one thing, and, but they need to do it really, really well. And there's so many things that folks think are important when it comes to a name that don't matter at all if it doesn't do this one thing. So things that people think are important is, well, it should relate to my business. It should be easy to say and spell. It should have a visual image. It should just sound cool and modern and hip. It should be a name that my friends laugh about and think is pretty cool too. You know, it's a name that should differentiate me from the competition. Et cetera, et cetera. Right. And it's like the Ten Commandments. And I used to teach high schoolers the religious ed, and, and they can never remem remember the Ten Commandments, which was extremely frustrating. And I said, okay, if you can't remember all the commandments, just remember the one that's most important. And, and this is the same thing with naming. The most important commandment is very simple the name has to be memorable. 
Mm. People have to be able to remember it. And there are a lot of ways to say that. One of the ways that we like to talk about it is it sticks to the roof of your brain. The name is sticky. It's so sticky that when you hear it, it's like peanut butter. It sticks to your brain and it's just, it just sticks there, right? And the next day you're still thinking about it. Like what in the world was that? Or maybe when you have a need a week or two later or a month or two later, you can recall that name because it was such an interesting, attractive name. Hmm. And I'll give you a couple examples of names that had so many problems. It was unbelievable when they first came out. And people don't think about this today, but they, these names were memorable. Yeah. So let's talk about Amazon. Amazon was a terrible name. I mean, really, really bad. We would put it in the bottom fourth of all the names when it came out with. Okay, here are the reasons why. What do people associate with Amazon if you've never heard about Amazon before? Well, some people would associate it with the Amazon River right? or the Piranha Eat You Alive. Some people might associate it with Amazon women right. and all the inappropriate sexual connotations with Amazon women. Some people might associate it with you know, the Amazon rainforest. It's being decimated and there's going to be a desert down there before you know it. Mm-hmm. Why would anyone call a bookstore when you had fantastic names like Bookstop and Barnes and Noble out there in the marketplace, Amazon, it made zero sense. But the one thing Amazon had going for it was, it was memorable and it caused people to pause, right? It's like, okay, now what are you talking about? I've heard of Amazon before, but I don't understand a business called Amazon. So it was a memorable name. Google was the same way. Uh, I can remember people making fun of Google. Well, that's what my my nine month old says when she's learning how to talk. Goo goo, yeah. Google. Nobody knew what Google was. That it was this, you know, variation on a math term that was this infinitely large number, or whatever the explanation was. But it was a name that aroused curiosity. So there was a search engine at the time that was out there uh, before Google came along called InfoSeek. Mm-hmm. And most people we talk to would say InfoSeek's a better name because InfoSeek tells you exactly what it does. Mm-hmm. It seeks out information. Google doesn't say anything about what it does. Right. It's a terrible name. But Google is the more memorable name. Now, I'm not saying Google succeeded just because it was memorable. Obviously, those guys are very smart and they did a lot of things right. But InfoSeek faded away into the ether. Mm-hmm. And we all know where Google is today. Mm-hmm. So the golden rule, and it's, it's more important than everything else combined except for legal availability, is the name has to inherently be memorable. Okay. So <clears throat> I know, I know, for instance, that I think it's somewhere in LA. I know that there is a breakfast place called Egg Slut. Okay. <laughs> now, th- <laughs> this would be memorable. I mean, I'm mentioning it now. And I I came across this article 18 months ago. It's memorable. It's edgy. It's there's risk involved, but there's got to be something too about yeah. Okay, well we can make something (laughs) memorable. It's kind of like when we have people come to us and say, I just you know for publication and and publicity, I just want to get on the evening news. And I and I always say, well we can get you on the evening news. (laughs) There's there's ways to to be covered in news reports, but you want to be covered for the right reason. Right. And so memorable for the right reason would be part of that. Yeah. Well, it always I'm often asked people will give me a name and they'll say, well, is this a good name or a bad name? And, and you cannot answer that question outside of context and strategy. And it sounds like a cop out. Like if someone were to come and say to me, well, I want to name my restaurant Egg Slut. You know, I want to name my fan company Big Ass Fans, which is another name that sort of falls in that uh-huh. same. Is that a good name or not? You, you cannot answer that question. It depends on, well, whom are you targeting, right? We know that's going to piss off and turn off a big chunk of the population out there. Right. And for most of our clients, that would be a non-starter. We do a lot of research because we used to be part of Nielsen. And one of the things we look for is polarization. We don't want a super safe name, right? We don't want a name that doesn't offend anyone or that isn't a little bit edgy and doesn't raise a few eyebrows. Yes, because those kind of names and, and, and the name that I mentioned earlier, earlier, InfoSeek is exactly that kind of a name. It's a very safe, descriptive name. Unfortunately, it's very boring and nobody can remember it. Nobody cares about it and it doesn't generate any conversation. A name that's a little edgy 
that maybe alienates two or three percent of your target. That makes it worth conversation. Okay. That's the kind of name people want to talk about. That's the kind of name that spreads organically through the social ether without you having to do hardly anything. So you want a name that's got a little bit of that. But like if we did research on egg slut, my guess is it'd be very polarizing, right? You'd have some people that would they just think it's funny and cool, they wouldn't be offended. And they said, yeah, that's that's so different than anything else I've heard of. I got to try it, right? Mm-hmm. And and I suspect the strategy is, look, if we can pull them in and generate trial, and that's often the strategy with an edgy, really controversial name. We just want people to give us a try. Then the quality of our service and the quality of the meals we serve is going to bring them back no again and again and again. Yeah. But okay. if we can't get them in the door, because there are a zillion other restaurants in LA and everybody's competing for that same, you know, morning uh, day part, we're never going to get at, get out of the shoot. And so we need a name that cuts through all that clutter without us having to spend hardly any money and generates that conversation. And if that was their strategy, egg slut might've been a great name for a small segment of the population, but maybe it's large enough to generate the trial and they have a great enough product and service and menu that then word of mouth does the rest. But for other clients, it would certainly not work very well. Well, you bring up a, a point that we we encounter often in design, which is when you encounter something that really um, you hate, like creates that visceral response of like, ugh, I'm, I'm rejecting this outright. One of the things we have to talk about constantly is, well, they're not talking to you. So it's entirely possible that that thing that, is so revolting to you is absolutely landing with a segment that is thrilled about it. Um, so it, it sounds like there's some definite crossover there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one, one of the things I tell clients or anyone that I talk to, and it's sort of a variation mark on what you just said, is what you think of the name really doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And that just drives our clients crazy, especially owners of small startups where it's the company name. And they look at me and say, you absolutely are wrong. The name of my company absolutely does matter to me. And I say, well, it's a bit of an overstatement. But the only thing that really counts is what your targets think of the name. That's right. Now, the targets aren't necessarily, though, just the customers. And that's where a lot of people get confused. Often, the customers are a huge target, maybe the most important target. But in some cases, that's not, that's not the case. In some cases, it's the employees, right? You need a name that gets the employees excited, especially in certain industries today. Now that we're coming out of COVID, it's hard to find talent, right? A lot of folks have just sort of gone off the grid. And so it's a recruiting nightmare. And so you need a name that energizes and excites the right kind of people you want to bring in the door. So your number one target might be those employees because with the right people, you then can generate the sales, pull in the customers. But you need that name to work for employees. For other clients, it's the investors, right? We do a lot of work with startups or folks that are in their A round or their B round of funding. So they've got some VC money behind them, some venture capital money behind them. They're looking at that IPO, right? They're looking to take their name and have a public offering at some point. And they need the investment community, the analysts, the financial guys and gals that follow that industry to be excited about the name. And that's not necessarily always the same name that really excites customers. I would say generally though, it's the customer. In some cases, it's the distribution partner, right? We have some small retailers that often rely, or they used to rely on brick and mortar. I think that's gonna come back. They, they rely on the big box chains, the big brick and mortar outlets for distribution. Yeah, they can do a certain amount on their website and maybe they can do a certain amount on Amazon, but Amazon takes a big chunk of that, that margin right out of their sales dollar. So they're looking for the big box retailers and they need to make sure that the name works for the buyers, right? Works for the buyers at those big box or those retail companies so they can get the distribution that they need. So it's not always the customer, but you're absolutely right. It's for sure, it's for sure, usually not the people that you know are coming to you and asking. And, and what kills me is we, we develop names for millennials all the time because millennials is now sort of a hot market. We'll have a committee that we present to of eight to 10 people. There's not a single millennial at the table. <laughs> so what are we going to do? You know, right. it, it really doesn't make any difference what you guys think, right? Right. So right. Uh, 
how frequently does it happen that you watch a client pick the thing they shouldn't pick? Now, I know that you would work very hard not to be presenting anything that you wouldn't feel great about bringing to the client as a possible selection. But in the course of teasing out and really doing the deep dive, do you ever see a client pick against what you really see as their best interest? And they just like double down, lock down on it's got to be that. I'm going to piggyback that with another angle of how do you move a business owner who is in love with the name they're bringing to you? I mean, how often does that happen? That they're like, well, I had some ideas for you. And you're like, these are awful ideas, but they're kind of married to it. You can tell. I mean, how do you, how do you, we, we just, all that? We, you can tell we've had moments where you're just like, <laughs> no, not, not that, whatever you do, not that. Yeah. Unfortunately, both those scenarios come up a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a, a lot of folks will go with a name that we don't think is their best choice. And the data may even show that and they ignore the data. And, and Tim, that sort of goes to your second question. If the owner is in love with a name, we always ask for permission to test that name against some new name ideas. And before we do that, we say, if the data clearly shows on a variety of metrics that some of these new names score better than the name you're, you really like, would you be willing to change the name? And if they say no, then we don't proceed. There's no reason for us to have an engagement when we don't think the client's gonna to listen to our advice. Hmm. Um, if they say, I would consider it, I may not change my mind, but I would at least consider it, then it, then we're balls to the wall, then we wanna take on that project. They still sometimes at the end won't change, but at least they were willing to consider the possibility, right? So we at least need them to have that degree of openness. I'll give you an example of a name we came up with and I presented more than once because we do a lot of work in the tech space. So we work for almost all the major semiconductor manufacturers and a lot of computer manufacturers. And they all, they all pretty much want the same thing, whether you're talking about a new chip or a new computer. The, the value prop always has something to do with it's faster, right? Mm -hmm. Now anymore, it's not that because they're all so fast. But for many years it was, well, this is now twice as fast as our old version. Right. So when you open up, you know, Outlook and PowerPoint and Word, things are just going to pop and you're never going to be slowed down by that, that machine. So the name we presented, and this was probably, you know, five, 10 years ago, because it's a little dated now, but back then it wasn't quite as bad, but we never could get anybody to log on and latch on to was Streaker. Call this new computer Streaker or call this new chip Streaker because it was, it would blow the socks off on memorability for a variety of reasons, right? Right. Everyone that's, you know, my age and a little bit younger, maybe your guy's age, can still remember the videos of the streakers, you know, oh, yeah. running across the baseball diamond or the football field or whatever it is. And they were fast and they were fun. And all the cameras would pan on them regardless of what was going on in the field because it was something that every, oh, my God, we got on the street. It's almost like you, you look forward to seeing the streaker sure. at the baseball game, especially if it, well, you were in the outfield, you know, they never hit a home run. You're half asleep in the, in the seventh inning. Anyway, that was viewed consistently as too risky you know that it just you know our our corporation's a little more buttoned down a little more conservative than that we we just don't think streaker is the way to go so that's an example of a name that for a while had some traction we thought today unfortunately um a lot of folks don't know what a streaker is <laughs> yeah and so or, or they know what it is and it sounds, that's what my mom and dad used to do, right? Or that's what my aunt and uncle, you know, did once and told the story. I mean, it, it has that data. It's not really cool and hip anymore. So you, you always have to be aware of the, the trendiness and when a name sort of, you know, drops out of fashion. Yeah. What, uh, tell me some of your greatest successes. What are you, I mean, you get, you're a guy who gets to kind of leave your handprint on the nation in a very cool kind of way. Uh, what are like what are your some that you're most proud of and some of your favorites well there, there are all kinds of names we come up with that i think have served you know our customers well one of the ones that was sort of an interesting story is that uh, and this was years ago um boston beer and they make sam adams beer that's probably the brand they're best known for they they had an issue and this is all public so i'm not revealing anything that's that's proprietary um Gals in general didn't really like the taste 
or the calories or the amount of alcohol, but they still wanted to go to the bar and they still wanted to have a, friend, a good time with the boyfriend or the group of their friends. And they still wanted to be, at, be able to ask for something that made for a nice bar call and didn't get confused with all the other bar calls across, across the counter in, in a noisy club or a noisy bar. And so Boston beer thought a hard cider, right? It, it's a, it could be apple based or some other fruit based, but it has a lighter uh, flavor. It's a little bit sweeter. It really appeals um, to a lot of palates that are out there and they're testing. And it didn't have as much alcohol and it didn't come across quite as heavy. And so it was targeted originally at that female um, buyer. And the name, we gave them a lot of names, but the name they ended up going with was Angry Orchard. Well, that was not the obvious winner initially. Okay. There were some concerns about that name. Um, angry is a pretty negative word, right? Right. And, and some people feel you should never go, you know, negative in a name. And Mark, it goes back to your egg slut example, right? Slut is such a strong negative, really? Or big ass fans. You really want to put ass in the name of anything? And angry had a little bit of that. Well, why would you put angry in there? But what ultimately worked well was Angry Orchard had a personality, right? It wasn't a soft cider. It wasn't a fruit juice. It was a hard cider. It had an edge. It had some alcohol. And Boston Beer, we had nothing to do with this. Boston Beer did a wonderful job on the package graphics. So if you go out and you look at a six pack of oh, Angry yeah. Orchard, you'll see a sort of a gnarly tree um, with these sort of ugly looking apples. And those are actually the kind of apples that make the best hard cider. These are not the, the kind of apples you see in a grocery store. The apples that make the best ciders are a little bit gnarly. You know, they have these knobs on them and, and they look sort of ugly, but man, they, they really deliver on flavor and taste and everything else. So that name actually worked very well because it was so different than anything else out there. It was an easy bar call. Hey, give me an angry orchard. Right, it didn't get confused with anything else at the clubs or the bar, and and since then a lot of varietals have come out, and I think you know Sam at our Boston beer has done very well with that name. That's one of the names that I thought was a, was a pretty cool name, even though it was a tough sell at least initially because there were some concerns about you know at least part of that name. Sure, yeah, I love it. Fascinating. You were also telling us a little bit about uh, an engagement you had had with uh, Circuit City. Yeah, and then this name is not nearly as creative. So one of the things that's interesting is that people always think that for a name to be great, it has to be so cool and hip and different that everyone just says, ah. And, and some of the best names out there aren't that, right? But they're, they just work and they work for all the reasons that were sort of strategically important. So Circuit City came to us and they were you know, an electronics retailer. And they said, we want to get in the used car business, which was a bit of an odd, <laughs> an odd, you know, pivot. But they said, you know, look, it's such a sleazy business. People get a bad taste in their mouth. They, they don't even want to go in or, or go onto the lot and look at used cars. They don't know much about cars. They always feel like they're going to get ripped off. And even after the fact, you know, even if they got a good deal, they never know if they've got a good deal. So there's always that doubt in your mind. Well, did I, did I really do well at the price I ended up paying for that car? Yeah, so, and it, it so, actually becomes more about the haggle than it does the correct. product that I drive off the lot. Yeah. So circuit, that's exactly what Circuit City wanted to do. They wanted to eliminate the haggling. So they said, we are going to make used car bill, uh, buying a professional, simple, fun experience. We're going to have the prices clearly marked. We're going to have the history of the cars. We're going to have salespeople that aren't on commission for selling vehicles. They're just there to help the customer. We're going to be very transparent. And this was before the days that authenticity and transparency were so in vogue like they are now. Mm -hmm. I mean, they really, they really sort of innovated that in the automotive space, at least, you know, showing you exactly the history of the vehicle, all the stuff, you know. And so we gave them a lot of names. And the name they ended up going with was CarMax, which isn't a real sexy name, but it was a great name at the time because they wanted a name that was short enough that it could pop off a billboard when folks were driving down the street and they knew where to turn in. So whether you're on an interstate or just a busy highway, CarMax on a big billboard, you could see from pretty far away and it sort of told you what it was, right? Well, it has something to do with cars and Max. Max could be a lot of inventory. It could be a maximum experience in terms of customer service and 
professionalism, who knows, right? They sort of built that story around CarMax, which is another reason they liked the name, is that it had enough runway so they could take the max portion and turn that into a complete story about how they were sort of maximizing the whole buying experience, right? Better inventory, you know, no haggling, uh, guarantee, all the things that you weren't typically getting in the used car buying experience, CarMax sort of brought to the table. So it was an easy name to understand. People could remember it. They, they didn't remember it for the same reasons you'd remember an Angry Orchard, right? Angry Orchard was sort of sexy and fun and had a personality. Mm -hmm. CarMax was just very functional. I get it. It's where I can go buy a car and I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not going to feel ripped off or anything. And, and so since then, of course, Circuit City has gone out of business and CarMax is flourishing. So that's another example of Story. It's also really well balanced, the CAR right. and the MAX. That's nice. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, there was another name we came out with years ago before the green uh, thing became a big deal. Uh, but Freon was known to home harm the ozone layer. And so regulations were, were starting to appear that Freon is going to have to be phased out over the next 10 years around the world. I mean, this is a big deal because mm -hmm. people back, you know, even oh, yeah. 15, 20 years so, but the problem we have, United Technologies came to us and they make carrier air conditioners and Bryant furnaces and, and the kind of stuff that people heard of. And they said, we need a name for a new Freon. The problem we have is we got thousands of dealers and these dealers have to be able to explain this name quickly to their customers who are fixing to buy, you know, a carrier air conditioner. Right. So it can't be that different, but it needs to sound greener and cleaner and better and more environment, environmentally correct than Freon. So the name we gave them was just Puron, P-U-R-O-N instead of F-R-E-O-N. Now that actually violates some of the rules you would normally follow in a new name, right? You normally would not want a name that's confusingly similar to the name you're replacing. But that name worked really well because it was confused. It was similar. It wasn't confusingly similar, but it was similar enough that dealers could say, oh, no, you don't want Freon. You want Puron because pure just inherently sounds yep. more pristine, cleaner, healthier, better for you, better for the planet, better for the world. And so the name didn't require hardly any education or sales effort to sort of convince consumers, oh, well, of course, I want Freon or Puron in my air conditioner. I don't want Freon which is that old uh, refrigerant that's being phased out because of the damage it causes. Right. How often have you seen businesses get into hot water because of their name? I mean, is that a regular part of your world? And um, Yeah, I mean, more so today than in the past. I mean, every decade, it, it's, it's much more challenging um, to get a name cleared because there's so many hurdles, right? And, and in some cases, a small a startup won't get in any trouble until they get bigger, right? They, they, don't, they don't go through the trademark registration process. They start using the name. Uh, they're okay for a few years because they're below the radar. And all of a sudden they start growing and they start you know, having a more of a web presence and a social media presence and they get the dreaded cease and desist letter. And that's what it's called. Right. <laughs> you'll, get a, you'll get a letter from a lawyer and it says, you know, cease and desist. You know, you got to stop using this name and you've got so many days to do it or you're going to get sued for trademark infringement. And that just starts all kinds of alarm bells and problems, oh, yeah. and it happens all the time, and it's a mess. But we get a lot of business, unfortunately, from folks that were sort of in that situation. I can think of cases where 10 years have gone by. You know, someone's used the name for 10 years, and they've finally grown to a large enough size. Or another thing is they've extended their business, right? And, and let's say you start out as a restaurant. Your example, you know, the egg slut example. You start out as a, as a restaurant in LA, you got one location and you never bother to register your name as a trademark and you use it. Or maybe, maybe you do register, maybe you register for, for restaurants, mm -hmm. but man, it's, it's a cool brand. You know, it, you know, people like egg slut. We're going to, we're going to develop a line of apparel because we're going to have some egg slut, you know, jeans that are really edgy and we're going to have some egg slut shirts. Well, just because you have trademark rights to use egg sluts for restaurants, doesn't give you any trademark rights necessarily use it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so you start doing that and then you get sued by the person that you're infringing upon because you've extended your brand. You've grown your brand into these other areas. That's a very common problem we also run into mm -hmm. with folks these days. Yeah, those, those egg slut uh, sweatshirts are huge in Iceland. <laughs> and you just, we never saw it coming. 
So when is a good time to name yourself properly or change your name? Well, if you know you have to do it, and we often talk people out of changing a name, which seems a little counterintuitive since we're in the naming business, but we've had clients come to us and they say, we've used this name for 30 years. And our board of directors thinks it's time to change the name. And we say, well, is there any other reason you're changing the name? Has, has your business model changed? Are you doing something new, cool, and different? Are you extending into new areas? Is there any legal problem with the name? Your customers dislike the name? Oh, no, our customers love the name. We're pretty much doing the same stuff we've always done. We're growing at a reasonable pace. We're just tired of the name. Well, that's not the reason you want to change the name. And, and, and the reason for that, of course, is it is incredibly difficult to build equity in any new name today. There is so much noise out there uh, from so many different channels, you know, whether it's, you know, all the social media venue, I mean, just pick it. I mean, we are just bombarded that every one of our clients, except for the most sophisticated, underestimate how hard it is to build that unaided awareness. And that's the first pillar, that's memorability. When I talk about memorability, I'm talking about unaided awareness. That is, if, if, if we showed you guys a bunch of names, and this is how you test for it. You can't ask somebody if a name's memorable because they can't answer the question. So the way we do it is we'll go out and ask a bunch of folks, you know, which of these names do you like the best and why? And we ask them a bunch of other questions. We thank them very much. We don't tell them ahead of time we're going to do this. We let a day go by or two, no more than two days. We recontact them. And the first question we ask them is, hey, remember those names for that new restaurant we talked to you about the other day? Oh, yeah, those are great. Super. Which ones can you remember? Right. Unaided aware. It's unaided recall, unaided awareness. 24 to 48 hours after initial exposure. What's so interesting is the names they say they like the most are often not the names they can remember initially because mm -hmm. they tend to gravitate. We all tend to gravitate towards names that are familiar, that right. sound right for the category. Those are the names that are comfortable. Oh yeah, that makes sense for a cereal or that makes sense for an automobile. That's the kind of name I would, I would want my next car to be. But it sounds like all the other names out there and so they either forget it or they confuse it with a competitor name or they get it partially right and partially wrong. The names that are novel, that are catchy, that are different, that are a little bit edgy, those are the ones that are memorable. They may not score as a favorite, they won't necessarily score at the bottom, but that's why it's so important to, to do that. That's great, yeah, it's fascinating. Man, okay, so we always ask this, this question just to give you platform. Is there anything in particular right now that you're excited about that you want a general audience to, to know about, to be aware of? Uh, is there some new territory that you're pushing into? Well, yes, there is. And, and it's, it's, um, it has to do with how you test for a name and, and how people think about names. And it, it's not as esoteric or abstract as it thinks. It has to do with behavioral science and system one, system two, or inferred versus explicit responses. And that's all, you know, techno jargon. Basically, here's what it comes down to. This is so interesting. It blows me away. As soon as you ask someone, what do you think of this name? You're getting a biased response. Right. You're not getting a legitimate read. And the reason for that is most people in most settings don't consciously think about whether or not they like a name. It's not at the conscious level. It's at a subconscious level. It's what well, the name just grabs me or doesn't. I don't know why I like it. I just did. Right. right. So the research that we're now doing is we don't ask that question. What we'll do is we'll maybe give them, pick a number, 10 names. And we say, okay, we want you to put these 10 names into one of these five boxes. I love this name. I hate this name. Right. So you got these five boxes. And we'll look at the speed and the order. And let's say everybody instantaneously picks a name and they give it that top box score. Love this name. And then a minute later, right, after they fought and they, they maybe move the names around a lot, the very last name, they move to that top box. Most research methodology today does not differentiate. They'll say both those names are great names. They both are names that the customer said they loved. Mm -hmm. But in the real world, we all know that that name that they just immediately and intuitively with almost no thought picked is far better for almost every one of our clients than the name that required a lot of thought because nobody goes there, right? No one's gonna think hard about a name unless they're super excited about that product or they're creative types like you guys are and we are, right? So that's, that's something that we're excited about. And I think that's the direction that naming research is going. And we're certainly 
trying to push that uh, in that direction too. Wow, that's pretty fascinating. So you're not you're not necessarily even looking at the quality value content of the name. You're just looking purely at speed. Order and speed. And, and, and there's some other things, right? I mean, indecisiveness is something else. I mean, sometimes if they're doing this online, you can track the number of mouse clicks and how they, you know, the number of right. pushes with their finger. <laughs> and a the name they can't make up their mind about, right? They move it, I hate it, I like it, I'm not sure. And you never know where it's going to end up. It's, it's meaningless because nobody thinks about a name that. I mean, think about names that you guys react to, and, and you guys are not even normal. You know, you'll give it a second or two in most cases, at most, and then, right. and then you're gone, you know, right. and if it grabs you, then you might pick up the package if it's in a store, or you might right. click to the website if you're doing some, some, some web browsing, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That's, that, all of this is such a, a fascinating whole arena of, of thinking and, and of, of knowledge, and, you know, we, we talk about how often the deep value is not in places people look for it they, there's you can put you can throw money at google and at facebook all day but the value of a proper name is a, is so deeply inherent it's what what i like right. about it is that it is that marriage of the art and the science and so if you move past the idea that uh, the name is about artistic expression or does it reflect my true essence in the core of our very being and really look at, no, I know, but like quantitatively, it doesn't perform as well. That is a fun mix because yeah. it doesn't really matter how gonzo creative it is if it's not landing. So, right. Well, Mike, thank you so much for spending time with us today. We got a lot out of this. Yeah, absolutely. You bet. Well, let me leave you with one last thought. And it's yeah. pretty obvious, but I always like to close with something I think is a, is a takeaway. You only have one chance to make the right first impression. And that almost always is your name, right? In conversation, if you yourself personally are introducing yourself, my name is Mike Carr. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's some weird name they've never heard of before or some name that they associate with their pet dog, you know, you've got a problem, right? Right. And, and so that's what we always tell clients, right, is, is you have to think about, is this the name, you know, that's going to create that impression, that memorability that I really, really need? Because you only can do that once, you know, and then, then it's just catch up after that, right? That's right. So something to think about as you work on your next new name. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for your time. You Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. You bet.